Okay, so there are many hash functions in literature, but before moving on to hash functions for this kind of dedicated designs, let's look on other ways of designing hash functions. For instance, one way is to use a block cipher as a hash function. This might be useful. Actually, I will uh, also say it in the slide, but for instance, if you already implemented a block cipher on a hard way, hardware, so it might be also good for it for you to use it as a hash function so that you don't have to put another algorithm inside the device okay but uh, generally you know using a block cipher as a hash function are not that preferred in practice okay but let's see how you can convert a block cipher into a hash function it is possible to construct a hash function from a block cipher where we replace the compression function with the block cipher encryption algorithm. If you already deployed a block cipher, we might consider building a hash function from it because we can make security claims about the hash function using the analysis of the block cipher. Because if you convert a yes into a hash function, you know all of your security analysis on the block cipher also applies for the hash function. So you might say, have some security claims and so on. Moreover, we can save space and implementation effort by reusing some of the components of the block cipher. However, hash functions constructed from block ciphers are generally slower than a hash function with a dedicated design. Okay. So uh, let's look at how we do it. A compression function has two inputs, the chaining variable h and the message m where compress h i minus one and m i provides you, you know, h i. Okay, so assume we have a, such a function as compress that takes two inputs and provides a single output. So instead of the, this compression function, we will use a block cipher like AES, okay? A block cipher has two inputs already because it, the inputs are the secret key and the plain text block. So I can put them here and run the uh, block cipher and provide an output. So instead of the cipher text, this time we will produce something else, okay? So if we try to form compress equals the encryption of the plain text block with the secret key, exhort with the cipher text, then we can replace K, P, and C with one of the values like H, I, minus one, M, I, and so on. And this way you can actually, you know, uh, create many possibilities. For instance, instead of this value, you can write your secret key and the plain text, or you can write plain text and the secret key and so on and so forth. So you can modify all of these. So there are many uh, possibilities, but out of these 64 possibilities, the 12 of them are considered as secure and three of them are particularly important. So in literature, you can see these three uh, constructions. Actually, there isn't good, uh, written material about it. So Google might not help you, but there are really these methods in the literature, okay? So let me show you how they work. So we have the block cipher. So it has two inputs, you know, the secret key and also the plain text, and you provide the uh, outside the cipher text, right? So if you put this uh, block cipher as a compression function, it uh, works like this. Again, you provide the two inputs, plain text and the secret key. So you provide the output, but you exhort the output with this one and provide the result, okay? So if you remove this part, uh, then you know it becomes uh, deterministic as uh, one to one and onto, but once you exhort it, you know, you actually kind of hide your steps, let's say. Okay, so this is the vs mayor construction. Let's move on to Matthias mayor Oseas construction. You might say that, okay, this picture is the same as the previous one. And yes, it is the same, but the places of the plain text and the secret key are swapped, okay? Of course, here now I don't have the secret key. Okay, so let's actually, we haven't seen the uh, merkel damgard construction. So maybe some of these definitions might not mean makes sense but what i'm trying to here recall that hash functions don't use a secret key so you provide the input and obtain an output right so i have a huge output for instance i divide it into blocks 
and I feed these blocks into the block cipher as if they are plain text. But as a secret key, I start with an IV. So I encrypt the first block and obtain the result. And if I more blocks, I take this value and feed it from here and do it this uh, iteratively. And at the end, I will provide a single output, which equals to the block size. So regardless of your message size, for instance, maybe it was one gigabyte, I repeated this process and provided, for instance, if I use AES here, I provide 128-bit output, okay? So instead of using the block cipher as a, an encryption algorithm, I used it as an hash function where I don't have a secret key, okay? So I have a huge input. I put it inside this algorithm and provide you a single output which is 128 bits. So if you use this here, the output will be 64 bits, which would not be enough for us. And finally, Matthias Mayer OCS construction here. Uh, ah, sorry, this was the second one. So the last one is Miyaguchi Prenar construction. Here we also exhort this one to you know, make attacks more complicated. You might say that, okay, uh, it is a very strange construction, but again, if you don't want to use another hash function, you can use this block cipher, for instance, AES, and run it as a hash function, okay? Okay, so uh, these, this was about how to uh, construct a block cipher, in, convert a block cipher into a hash function. But let's focus on other designs for hash functions. I will talk about merkle damgard construction here, which is the actually the mostly used one. But nowadays we use sponge functions. So I will also show you how a sponge construction works for hash functions. So first start with merkle damgard Okay. In this case, we have to construct with iterated construction. Many hash functions adopt an iterative design to accommodate a variable length input. So a merkle damgard construction is the most famous one. Message M is divided into fixed length blocks where M is you know, divided into in this scenario T blocks, T plus one blocks and you apply a suitable padding to the end. And padding is really important here. If you do padding in the wrong way, then you know your hash function can be broken easily. Message blocks are compressed one after the other to produce HI using a compression function F. HI is called a chaining variable and used in the compression of next message block M plus, MI plus one. In other words, compression function uses MI and HI minus one to produce HI, okay? HI zero is fixed and specified as a part of the hash function specification. So in the documents, you will see an IV initialization vector, which starts this process. And sometimes a finalization operation is applied to overcome some attacks, okay? So let's look at a basic picture. So this is how merkle damgard construction works. So you have a compression function, in the previous pictures, I used a yes here, but now I'm going to use something as like MD5, SHA1, SHA2, et cetera. So this compression function is actually when we say SHA2, SHA2 is, F is replaced with SHA2 here, okay? But this whole construction actually produces the output and it is called merkle damgaard construction, okay? So you have the message, perform a padding on it, then the result is divided into blocks. In our case, the block size sometimes will be like 512 bits and so on. So you start with an IV. So if you have a single block, you take this block, you take the IV, so you have two inputs and produce an output here. But if you, more, if you have more blocks, you keep continue doing this. So you take this H1 and put it as an input, take the second message block and put it as an input, and produce an app. So you continue this way until you run out of inputs. So this is why uh, the time you need to perform to take a hash operation actually depends how many blocks you have. So generally, hashing two blocks is twice takes times than hashing one block. Okay. So here actually now we need to talk about how F can be constructed. So in the previous pictures. I showed you that we can use, instead of the F function, we can use a block cipher. And instead of that merkle damgard construction, we can use this picture. But uh, dedicated designs follow this idea. So instead of F, 
you can put MD4, MD5, SHA1, SHA2, SHA3, etc. And we will see how they look like in the following slides. But before talking about Merkel Damgaard construction, SHA3 is a sponge construction, and many lightweight NIST competition algorithms support hashing, and they are also most of them are sponge constructions. So we have to see what the sponge function is and how can I have a hash function from a sponge function, okay? This picture actually uh, summarizes the whole procedure and tells you how to pro obtain a, a hash function from a sponge function, okay? So in this picture, MI are input. So you have a message which is divided into blocks of M0, M1, and so on. So in this picture, you have four blocks. ZI are hash outputs. Here, uh, we have two terms called capacity and, sorry, capacity and rank represented with C bits and R bits. I will explain in a minute. The unused capacity C should be twice the desired resistance to collision or pre-image attack. So this is generally what we have as a security proof. Sometimes uh, these proofs are input, but anyway, so this is how it works. You have a very huge internal state. Okay, it is filled with R bits and C bits. So the whole internal state is R plus C bits. Okay, so initially you fill it with some data, maybe with IV. Okay, so you start feeding the uh, your message from here. You exhort it, but only R bits are fed. So the bottom C bits are not modified. Okay, this is why we call it capacity. Then you perform a F function. This is generally a permutation. And in some designs, this is just SPAX operations, permutations, and so on. So this way, you modify your internal states, OK? Feed the second message block by exhorting it to the top part, then perform permutation and uh, you know, confusion and diffusion layers, like substitution and permutation. You keep feeding the message this way, so internal state becomes modified during this process, okay? When it ends, so when you run out of message blocks, now it is time to provide output, okay? So at the end, you provide the top R bits as your R bit output. Then you perform operations again, this F function, so you modify the internal state again, then produce R bits again, R bits again. So in this scenario, we produce 3R bit output, but input was 4R bits, okay? So regardless of this input size, you generally provide fixed output, okay? So this is called absorbing phase because you are feeding the uh, message here. So think about it as a sponge and you are filling it with water. Now here you are squeezing the sponge and you know the water comes out. This is why we call it a sponge function. Okay. 